so today we have Kedar talking about um, Velda, Podman, Scopio, Docker, and uh, what else? So I am going to share the recording. Can you see the slides? <clears throat> yes, it's perfect. All right, perfect. Let's get started. So uh, without further ado, let's get going. So um, uh, this is kind of an hour long presentation, so we'll have to run a little bit, uh, but it's also meant to be sort of an intro level for how to do clustering and uh, parallel computing. So I don't know how many students we actually have in this uh, session of DevConf. It was meant to be um, something that the BU students could use. We'll find out, I guess. So uh, a little bit of um, personal history. I had the privilege of spending my entire career in free and open source software. Uh, I'm the product management director for Ceph Storage at Red Hat. Previously, I was the Ubuntu server PM at Canonical. If you use the Ubuntu 1404 um, server, that was my baby. Uh, and if you go back the decade, uh, the systems management czar at SUSE, uh, the dreaded systems management czar. So uh, shameless plug, I have a book on AWS system administration by O'Reilly. And that's why you see the clouds there in the picture. And uh, here are a few things that I worked on. Uh, we're not gonna go into those, save time. Um, this slide is basically, there is no ability if you follow our instructions and stub your toe or bring about the end of the world um, or break your device, which is far more likely. Uh, this year, mischief is a lot less likely, but some smart Alec will doubtlessly succeed in destroying some hardware. I know I have. Uh, I have already smoked a Pi 4 HDMI port uh, when a loose cable touched the bare power supply. So um, the hardware is out of your budget. So uh, first breakout here, we're going to go and find um the pictures for assembly of the cluster and we're going to have a very quick tour of how this thing was built so um we packaged it very nicely in um, a travel safe case uh, with dune references for those of you that catch that um, because this was meant to follow me at conferences um, this version is the Pi 3 version of the cluster, which is the one that I have here in front of me. Uh, there is also a Pi 4 version, and I'm building a Pi 0 version uh, experimentally next month. I don't know about the Pi 0. I think that there aren't enough network interfaces to do a good job there. The Pi 4 is actually quite impressive, um, and we'll see why later. Uh, the Pi 3 is quite adequate as a development environment. And uh, what I did is that I put together this kit um, from a company, um, I believe they're based in Utah called Pico Cluster that gives you a case and uh, power wiring uh, and the power distribution uh, node to build a little cluster. And you can have three nodes, five nodes. I think they go to 10 or 20, they can get pretty beefy. But the idea here is that um, you can have an environment that resembles a supercomputer on your desk to try your code, to learn how to do MPI, to uh, compile things and run them the same way you would on the supercomputer without having access to the supercomputer or without wasting your, your time on the supercomputer if, uh, if you are being allocated the time by the hour as uh, sometimes is the case. Uh, here is the stack of the three nodes and the power distribution node up top. The, the case is laser cut plexiglass, so it, it looks very nice if you manage not to scratch it, which um, basically means don't uh, let dust get on it and, uh, and just a little bit of care should be enough. A power distribution from USB, nothing too strange here. And uh, one more wire, um, uh, one more wire you see going there. Uh, this is pretty much showing the same thing from all angles. The one more wire g comes down here and shows you uh, where the single power input is. Better shown here. So we bring out the HDMI of the first node and um, 
and the power supply in a 2.1 millimeter standard connector. Um, uh, pretty much everybody has power supplies for this. An Arduino has a power supply like this. Um, they're very easy to source at any electronics store. And uh, here is kind of how it looks when it starts. We added one more thing, which is uh, an array of LED lights on the side so that we can signal the state of the individual board. Mm, we could signal the CPU load or, or um, some kind of uh, processing activity so that folks have an idea of, of how their code is, is progressing without having to log into every single node. It's, uh, plus, it looks very cool. More pictures of the same. Software is in SD cards, nothing strange. It's um, a Raspberry Pi after all. Uh, here are the LED arrays for, um, for the uh, status of the individual boards. These are Pi Moroni made. Um, this is a British company that makes uh, accessories for Raspberry Pi. Um, the Blinked uh, is the, the name of this uh, accessory. This is meant to be vertical on top of the, of the board. Uh, we need them at 90 degree angles. So we had to find some, um, some 90 degree uh, GPIO connectors to, um, to turn the, the interface around. Once that is done, it looks like this. And uh, we added one thing over the Pico cluster design, which is that I wanted the, the switch to be integrated. So uh, we just stuck a switch on it and found right angle connector for the power supply on eBay so that, um, so that the power cable would not, uh, uh, could run under the cluster basically. And that's um, the quick version of the Pi 3. Uh, we can take a look at the Pi 4 just for the sake of completeness. It's pretty much a similar thing. Um, now we're going to ignore this. Uh, this is the way the kit looks like when you receive it. This uh, was one of the first versions of the Pi 4 cluster. And um, we have boards with four megabytes, uh, with four gigabytes of RAM. So uh, it's a nicer environment for supercomputing. And now you could get Raspberry Pis with eight, uh, although they are not very common yet. So if the workload is, is memory intensive, uh, that, could be, um, that could be a significant enhancement. The stack looks similar. The power distribution node is being completely redesigned, but it performs exactly the same function. Additionally, it provides power for uh, a network switch, which has been uh, broken out of its case <clears throat> and is part of the new plexiglass case for this interface. Pi 4 has two uh, HDMI interfaces. We bring out one from the node zero. And uh, here is the power supply. In this case, the power supply is internal. So everything, switch, power, the boards themselves, everything is internal to the case. Um, the case is, as a result, uh, bigger. We made the same addition as the previous one. And we added Pi Moroni blinked array is LED arrays to every node. And um, unfortunately, in this case, uh, in the first revision of this, um, of this uh, cluster, uh, Pico cluster placed the switch on the side where the LED arrays are. So it's not as visible as one would like, but <clears throat> they're still very bright. So you can still see what's going on. Here's the side with the internal power supply. Uh, this time, instead of having an adapter, we just have a, a, a three pole standard PC power connector. Uh, here is the fan that recirculates air out of the cluster. I replaced this fan, which is the one that comes stock with one uh, made in Austria. I forget the name of the vendor. It's a gaming hardware maker. Um, the fan runs a little bit slower. It's enough to, uh, to extract hot air from the case, which is all that we need. And the result is that um, the cluster is completely silent now. And it's uh, really nice. The, the power supply does not make any noise. And the, the fan of the case was the only noise source. So we were able to silence it completely. Here is the, the cluster from all sides. As you can see, it's about twice the size of the other one. 
but now everything is inside the case as opposed to power and um, and switching being outside of the case and it still fits in the in the tiny compact uh, travel case so now we have two um, and these survived multiple flights on airplanes so it worked out quite nicely uh, incidentally, one thing that I haven't added to the presentation yet, but it's interesting, there are um, temperature sensors on the pie, so uh, we can check if the boards are getting overheated. Maybe if you place the cluster in an environment where uh, maybe the room is hot um, more than the uh, interior of the cluster, but you can actually check in software if things are getting overheated, which may help you troubleshoot uh, certain types of um, sudden crashes or uh, freezes so we looked at the hardware and we're going to go uh, into the software now which is the uh, the first uh, big part of the talk so uh, we want to have a reasonable environment set up so that it's easy for um, for folks to work uh, on the cluster whether it's one user or many now um, you want to create a user uh, that has these properties, um, nothing too strange here. Uh, we built the, the images for the nodes using the Pika cluster software um, pre-built image because it was a little bit easier. You could use the Raspbian stock image, you could use a Fedora image, uh, you could use, use an Ubuntu image, that's all fine. Uh, just starting with the Pico cluster or Raspbian uh, variation seemed a little bit easier, so that's what we did. Um, to uh, we want things to be neat, so I decided that the, uh, that we want um, the user to reflect who the user is. So in this case, I'm renaming the user to myself. Um, to rename a user, you have to follow these steps. You cannot uh, uh, be logged in as the user being renamed, obviously, though. Um, in the slides, the pound sign means do the following as root. And the dollar sign means that uh, you can be a regular user instead. <coughs> uh, we can actually see, um, well, let's try connecting to the cluster. It will set up things nicely. So I haven't given you the full layout of, um, of the land uh, yet. I'm kind of assuming that you know how Raspberry Pis look like, but that's um, that's a little bit oh this error is because I have two clusters with the same pass with the same IP address, so. There you go. Uh, let's see. Um, this is the, the user setup. You can see that there is primarily uh, my user and a few um, a few programs that have their own um, their own user to run under. Another thing that you can do is this um, that will show you who you are. We want to do a little bit of a mini Unix tutorial. <laughs> um, and this one will show you who's logged in. Let me see. I'll increase the font size so it becomes a little bit easier to read this. There we go. We'll do something more interesting next time. Let's go back to the slides. So right now we're connected to node zero of the cluster. And I haven't given you the lowdown on how the hardware works because um, um, we're going to get to it as we see how things are set up. As I said, uh, the core is having me uh, or you as the default user. Because of the simple user structure in the cluster, there is no NIS, LDAP, or the like. NFS is remarkably straightforward. Um, we do create users with consistent user ID numbers across all nodes, particularly important if multiple users are going to share the same cluster. 
But on some clusters, I add the second unprivileged user, uh, Pi or Ops, to separate operations and production or to have a second account if um, I mess up the first uh, because um, the root account properly shouldn't be given SSH access. Um, and one thing that I can show you now is um, another thing that you can do as a proper administrator is that you can see when did someone lo last log in into the system with the last command. So th this is very basic system administration, which is either something you already are very familiar with or is new to you. Um, hopefully you're learning a couple of tricks, but um, one other thing is that it makes sense to disable X uh, on the cluster nodes other than uh, PC zero, the, the first node, which owns the HDMI interface. So we set init level three as default after the next reboot by uh, running the system D incantation. I leave the graphic environment installed in all nodes just in case. I just um, switch to init level three, which means that the nodes that are not running the UI, that they're not plugged into the, into the HDMI port are not actually running X and we save a little bit of CPU. We could also properly set X forwarding between the nodes if the applications were actually using um, um, uh, graphics, but uh, that's a topic for another day. Uh, we're looking at parallel computing. So I think we, we strayed enough into the graphics more than should be necessary. So the network, uh, this isn't the interesting part of building this cluster. We have static ethernet addressing on the physical interfaces of the Pi with uh, static addresses as follows. And then uh, we re-enable the Wi-Fi, which on the on the um, Pico cluster images is disabled to keep, uh, to keep um, certain types of um, networking interference at bay. We set up the network correctly so that that interference doesn't happen and we have both networks. The result is uh, we use the ethernet networking for local connection between the nodes so that the interface between the nodes and the interfaces that your program uses are consistent. And this is really cool because you can carry your cluster anywhere. Typically clusters are very unmovable objects, <laughs> um, either because of their physical size, but also just because of their networking. In this case, uh, because we have the dedicated network, the dedicated wired network with consistent IPs, it's gonna work anywhere. Uh, the part that we make adjust to the local environment is the Wi-Fi. And we just give each node a Wi-Fi connection um, to be able to download packages and the like, install updates, um, reach the internet for data if necessary. We could uh, have built a gateway where everything went through the first node. That would be probably a um, better practice in terms of enterprise practices, but I don't think it makes really sense in, in this kind of academic developer scenario. Um, do you know what you are doing? Um, and this way you enjoy better bandwidth and you don't overload the first node. Also the setup remains easier. So you could do this kind of proxy setup, um, but it seemed overkill, so I didn't do it. The Wi-Fi is set up this way. Uh, basically what we do uh, is that we re-enable DHCP on the Wi-Fi for installing updates and bringing in software. So the Wi-Fi configures IP addresses on its own. By setting up the Wi-Fi first, the routing gets attached there. And then we statically set up the local network. That's the part why uh, the Pico cluster guys had switched off the Wi-Fi and they were breaking the routing by doing it in the opposite order. You could also configure routes manually or explicitly using route but we like things to just happen correctly when you join a new network. We we're talking about mobility. So by joining the Wi-Fi first, we put the default route in place, whatever it may be as provided by the HCP. And then we statically configure the, the local network. Um, since we have all the details for that and we know how that's supposed to work already. Whereas for, um, for Wi-Fi, we don't, we have to, 
rely on DHCP. So this, this makes it very easy. Now um, you have to set up the wireless networks. Now, if you are um, uh, unfamiliar with that, it's very simple. Here is how it looks like. You can set up multiple wireless networks as needed. And uh, I guess you are ready to visit Red Hat 2 now. Actually, uh, that's our old Wi-Fi password, so don't get any clever ideas. But we can cover two interfaces, uh, any interfaces, however many you want, effectively. Finally, uh, we generate and uh, install access keys on all nodes. And we have the same users with the same user IDs, the same passwords, uh, and SSH key authentication throughout. So we don't have to use the passwords and the, uh, the master node, the, the node zero, can distribute the MPI workload to the other nodes. Um, so um, this basically enables the, the, the operator to be on the primary node and to run code on the entire cluster without logging in explicitly. That's pretty much necessary for MPI to operate correctly. We have password as a fallback in case something goes wrong, but it, it should never happen. Uh, by the way, a little pro tip, um, SSH import ID, SSH dash import dash ID, uh, there are the last command, um, lets you give access to GitHub or Launchpad users by username. So if you're working with somebody else, you don't have to play with email and send back and forth three emails asking them for their uh, public key. You can just ask them for their GitHub or Launchpad user ID and SSH import ID will get grab their public key from there and give them access. So that's uh, that's a very nice streamlining of um, of giving access to a collaborator. Gen keys is part of the standard um, Pico cluster distribution, and it's a very simple script that basically takes care of generating the keys and distributing them from uh, for you. Uh, and uh, it's part of a set of uh, cluster management scripts that Pico cluster makes available which provide basically uh, cluster management basics. Um, so uh, restart all nodes does exactly what it says. Um, full cluster reboot. Stop all nodes, shut down everything be, um, to prepare for powering down. And test all nodes uh, checks for connectivity. Resize RPI resizes the, uh, the SD card um, so that the image, the system image, takes advantage of the full size of the card uh, rather than, and then it's um, deflated. Um, I think it's four gigabyte size. I like to remove the .sh suffix, but that's just because I'm OCD in certain ways. And then I um, uh, fix the usernames, of course. There are usernames inside the cluster, uh, inside the scripts. And then I put them in a bin directory under the user's home for cleansiness. Since Raspbian is a Debian derivative, Debian expects that there is a bin directory in the user's home, even when there isn't one there. So you don't need to add it to the path. Uh, it's already there. You just create the directory and put, uh, put the files in there. They're already in your, in your default path. Um, so. Sometimes you just want to carry out administration tasks on all nodes. And Parallel SSH comes in. In the first example, the current user is going to all servers specified in nodes in the fi nodes file and, um, and uh, grabbing the host names, the statically configured host names. In uh, the third example here, we check connectivity. Uh, that um, sends one ping only uh, to that um, to that node. Count one, and uh, and we get the uh, success or failure result of that command, and it tells us uh, whether things worked out correctly or not. Uh, the fourth one is basically a DNS check. It's doing the same thing, but it's using the mit.edu domain name so that uh, we see if we have uh, DNS um, proper validation. And the last one is um, looking at temperatures, as I was um, 
kind of are showing you earlier. Uh, let's um, let's quickly do an example. We um, we have to be fast um, for the sake of getting through the entire presentation. But let's um, let's do the temperatures one. I have to get rid of the Unicode characters. Huh, something is wrong with node one. Welcome to the world of clusters. Hmm. Well, we'll debug that later. Looking at it externally, it seems fine. Oh, let's see. Yeah, I think that the network cable is loose. Let's see what's going on here. No. Well, no time to do that right now. We have those two nodes. So um, we see that it gives you the success uh, or failure status of the, basically the exit code of the command. And uh, you can either show or hide the output. In this case, the output is small, so I chose to show it. And that's why you have the uh, dash i, which is the same as here, dash dash inline option. If we did something like, um, uh, the ping here that we're going to do without the um, the inline option. And so that will only produce success or failure. Hmm. Okay. I'm not sure why that is. That should really not be a problem because we are connected. What's going on with the switching here? I'm reaching the nodes with SSH. A ping is. Hmm. Not sure. Let's make sure that the cables are there and reinitialize the whole thing. Hmm. Interesting. All right, well, uh, we're going to continue while the cluster reboots and hopefully Is this out? Um, right. So we have uh, only limited time. So let's get to uh, finishing the setup and then let's talk about parallel computing a little bit. So um, here is one last thing that you want to set up correctly, which is time. We set up the time so that it comes from a time server and all the clocks are consistent. Uh, this could be important in terms of making uh, um, a make consistent uh, with the fi uh, with uh, file signatures. Remember that the Raspberry Pi clock um, is not um, doesn't have a battery, so it starts at whenever it does 2012 or 2000. I can't remember um, until it's initialized from a time source. It's also not that impressive, so realigning it is a good thing. Um, there are also very obscure errors that you find in clustering when time is not accurate, which typically come from TLS sessions failing and the software relying on TLS not capturing the error correctly. So you see if you run a Kubernetes cluster on an overlay like this and the, the clocks are not correct, um, 
it will fail in horrible ways and will, it will not give you a proper error saying that TLS connections are failing because the clock is bad. So yeah, you want time set up correctly rather than discovering the hard way how it breaks, um, how it breaks things. We also set up a shared folder across the cluster so that we have an NFS folder on the uh, primary node that distributes um, the software that you're running to all the secondaries so that you can run MPI code um, across the cluster just by logging in on the first without doing anything else. Here is how you control the Blinken lights, uh, also known as the LEDs. I'm going to skip that because I want to give you um, supercomputers in a nutshell before um, we run out of time. So the Flint taxonomy has been used to distinguish parallel computers since uh, 1966 based on their data and instruction streams. This is Michael Flynn of Stanford, not Kevin Flynn of Tron, mind you. Um, these are different combinations on the um, table of whether uh, your CPU is processing data in one stream, in multiple parallel streams, and whether the parallel streams have the same data in them or not. Um, single instruction, single data is the original von Neumann architecture, which is the basis of all computers we have today. Uh, MISD is redundancy. You're running the same instructions on multiple CPUs, and you do this for um, redundancy primarily. The Space Shuttle control computer was doing this, running the same code three times and uh, seeing that the results uh, checked. This was an actual, actually an IBM 360 uh, modified for size, which is called AP101. Uh, the data parallel processing runs the same instructions over multiple data, uh, data items, while task parallel um, uh, well, task parallel processing runs different instructions over different data. MPI is usually used uh, for this last model in a variation of MIMD called SPMD for single program multiple data. Um, you may wonder why this is a variation of MIMD and not a variation of SIMD. And the reason is that SIM, by definition, implies instructions are executed in lockstep across the entire cluster. Here, they are not, even though the data is the same, the instructions are, uh, are the same, but not running lockstep. Uh, so in SPMD, uh, we usually execute the same instructions. We don't have to. MPI lets you stray from that. But we usually do that. But we do it in independent streams. Um, here is how you set up the MPI interface on the cluster. Um, we don't have to do that, so we're going to ignore it. But um, uh, the important part is that the MPI interface is the backbone of CPU-based supercomputing. Conceptually, it enables us to write C code where different data is being passed, passed to different CPU code cores <clears throat> on one or many hosts to be processed by the same code. Uh, Pacheco's parallel programming is a good reference, um, as are the MIT um, press titles covering MPI. So uh, here is how you build code uh, with MPI calls. Uh, and the part that's interesting is mm, how you execute it. So uh, MPI exec and eight call procs will spawn eight uh, processes um, and spread the, that call procs, which basically just calls a function and uh, reconnects, uh, recollects the results in one place. Uh, we'll spawn it eight times and collect or uh, harvest the results of those invocations. The second line here, MPI exec with uh, the host name specified, PC2 four times and PC1 four times, is basically distributing the four, uh, four each of the pro processes to uh, to the two secondary nodes is um, doing multi-system instead of the first call is basically self-allocated and it's, it's eight processes on the first one. By the way, the first one will fail if you run it on a Raspberry Pi 3 because uh, you only have four cores per node and you ask for eight. Um, 
So you can measure execution time with time with the time command. So you say time and then the execute the MPI command and that gives you the ability to benchmark the differences. This will give you a quick introduction to how many CPU resources you are going to waste during doing supercomputing. <laughs> and you can get an example here. You can run a thing 10,000, the a code 10,000 times and you get 10 digit precision, um, 100,000 times and you added two digits, three times as much and you added one more digit. Uh, the MPI 08B code here that's linked from this book is basically a code that's uh, calculating digits of pi. Uh, we don't have the time to uh, to go into that, but it's uh, it's a pretty simple um, integral calculation. We'll describe what it does in concept uh, rather than uh, than looking at the at the execution. Another way to look at this is that. Um, Parallelism's overhead uh, was already obvious. Um, we went from 21 to 16 seconds of wall time, but double the CPU resources we spent from four to eight cores. The first test is running on a single host on node one, while the second, uh, let me show it to you. Um, is running on Um, the first one is running on one node. The second one is running on two nodes. And you can see the network overhead um, shown in live. Those two seconds are purely network communication, which is neat. You usually don't get to see it so explicitly for a small workload. Um, this, this is a first cost, cost to the parallelism, network communication. In this setup, it's most obvious because of the slow switching on a Pi cluster. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, let's. Um, um, let's just leave it there and uh, go to one last comparison, which is with the Pi three. The, the other numbers were with the Pi 4. This is um, numbers from the Pi 3. The Pi 4 does three times better than the Pi 3 with this code, if anything, because of the heftier CPU cores. But comparing acceleration, the Pi 3 is almost 1.6 times faster <coughs> than itself when doubling CPU resources, while the Pi 4 achieved only 1.3 times acceleration. The explanation for this. <coughs> Um, is in the ratio between the CPU power and the network. And the real gigabit interface network on the Pi 4 is faster than the 4 gig on the Pi 3 by a fraction, but the CPU uh, improvement is that much higher uh, that the speed up is, is, um, is reduced because the, the, the improvement on the Pi 4 on the CPU side um, shadows the improvement on um, on the network side. Okay, last thing, last section. Let's see, we have um, a couple of minutes, I guess. Integration. So here are a couple of examples of what you do with supercomputers. Uh, there are basically three types of algorithms that come up all the time. Uh, integration is a simple example, run calculating the area under the curve by slicing the area under the curve and distributing the slicing calculation across the cluster. This is a typical way to, um, uh, well, approximate pi in this case by calculating the area under this curve. Uh, this is another example from Morrison's book. It calculates pi by numerically approximating this integral. Uh, there are many approximations of pi variously attributed to Euler, Ramanujan, Newton, and many others. Mathematical derivation is not our concern, but the meaning is what the formula tells us is that pi is equal to the area under this curve. Numerical integration solves this problem computationally rather than analytically. Uh, 
This is done by slicing this area in an infinite number of infinitesimal rectangles and summing up all the rectangles. An ideal parallel numerical challenge and one we have taken to 100,000 slices already with our benchmarks. The more the slices, the higher the precision. We just need to throw CPUs at the problem. Now, when we look at parallel code, we always talk about, we always talk about the speed up of, uh, of adding CPUs to the problem or adding computational resources to, to the problem. Can we make our code twice as fast? Sure. Can we make it 10 times as fast? Maybe. That factor, 2x or 10x, is called speed up in computing and is defined as the ratio of the original measurement and the new, hopefully improved one. So if your code used to take one second to execute and now it takes half a second, have a 2x speed up. Speed up is usually com computed on latencies or throughput. Let's analyze what's possible. Amdahl's law clearly observes that since parallelism is accelerating only a fraction of the code of the application, there is a limit to its efficiency. Ideally, speed up would be linear with the doubling of processing resources consistently halving the compute time and so on indefinitely. Unfortunately, few algorithms deliver on this promise with most showing linear speed up over a few CPUs and essentially decaying into a constant with many. An example. If your code takes 20 minutes to execute and just one minute of it can't be parallelized, you can tell up front without knowing any other details about the problem that the maximum speed up possible is 20x. You can use as many CPUs as you want to drive 95% of the problem asymptotically to zero time and you are left with one minute. And that's what Amdahl's law is basically saying. We do the math, one over uh, 0 0.05 is 20. That is the maximum possible speed up under ideal conditions, the absolute limit. This is a very good um, shortcut to keep in your mind when you're trying to accelerate code because there are things that you simply can't do. The, the non-parallel section, the critical section will uh, catch you. Uh, here is the f uh, formal explanation of Amdahl's law and what um, its limitations are. Um, you're going to have the slides, so we're, we're not going to go there. We don't have the time. But it's uh, walking you through how to use it uh, and how not to get lost. But let's look at an example. An example is if only 50% of the critical section can be parallelized, its theoretical speed up can't exceed 2x according to Amdahl's law. As you can see in the graph, it's not practical to use more than 12 cores to run this code since it can reach more than 90% of the maximum performance, maximum theoretical speed up with 12 cores, 1.84x. So now you know how many processors to throw at the problem. More are wasted. Instead, if, if only 5% of the code is the bottleneck, the asymptote speed up. The line at the bottom is our old curve, smashed down by the new comparison. In other words, if you can successfully parallelize 95% of the problem, under ideal circumstances, the maximum speed up for a problem is 20 times. This is a handy analysis tool to quickly determine what can be accomplished uh, when accelerating a problem without knowing too much about the problem. <coughs> Here is the other um, thing that is recurrent besides um, uh, integration. Different ways, uh, let's look at it with a different way to calculate pi. Um, we're going to use a computational algorithm that relies on repeated random sampling to arrive at numerical results called the Monte Carlo method. We keep selecting random XY pairs of a range between zero and one and given an even distribution from the pseudo-random num pseudo -random number generator, the number of samples found in the white circular segment and the blue area outside of it are in proportion to their areas. Think of it as calculating pi by throwing darts at the board and counting how many land inside and how many miss. Uh, we know how to calculate those areas. We know everything else. We know the diameters of the circle, so the end of the and the side of the squares. So we do the math, and we can figure out what um, 
that pi is four times the ratio of the hits over the total number of darts that you have uh, tossed. Um, Mr. Pythagoras taught us how to calculate the distance of a random point to the center of the circle. Just square its two coordinates, take the root of the sum. If the result is the radius or less, the dart hit inside the circle. We just keep throwing darts and count the hits. The circle is centered on the origin and has a radius equal to one, which makes the math easy. The area of the circle is pi, as the r squared term now equals one. And the ratio of the two areas is pi over four, so we'll need to multiply the result by four to get pi. Simple. And the code is actually even simpler. It's basically these two pages. Um, and it's doing exactly what I said, uh, calculating the ratio between these two numbers. This is working serially. I have another version of the code in the slides that's doing it uh, in parallel. Um, there is one. Uh, and there is one more algorithm that um, that I want to discuss, which is um, finite elements. Um, so finite elements is is the third type of um, numerical computation that's usually seen in play with with um, computers, and it's used to solve physics problems. Here you separate uh, the space of the object that you're analyzing into finite quantities, and you define the relationship with them. Typical example would be you have a an object of a certain size, you divide it in many small cells, squares maybe, and then you apply heat to one of the cells and you calculate how the heat spreads throughout the object by designing rules on how um, how the heat is uh, convected between, condu uh, conduced between the cells. Uh, this is a way to break into parallelism many physical problems and finite element or um, um, other variations thereof that have the finite name in common uh, or smooth particle hydrodynamics. Um, these are all um, ways to break up an object into smaller elements and calculate things like temperature, gravitational force, um, impact between, um, between bodies. Um, it's a very powerful technique that is very parallelizable. And that's the third, uh, the third type of thing that you would do with a supercomputer that's kind of stereotype. Um, we have a few uh, resources in terms of the sources that I've shown you. Uh, besides all the tools that I mentioned, Mathematica and its distributed calculation engine are available for free on Raspberry Pi, which can come really handy. For example, all the curves and the formula that I've shown you, I rendered that way. Um, and um, there are other avenues that you can take this cluster in. Um, you could use it for TensorFlow um, if you are um, an AI kind of person, or you could use it to run your own Kubernetes environment or OpenStack environment if you're more of a DevOps or um, infrastructure, I guess is the right word, kind of person. It's a very nice way to to experiment with um, with doing things in a way that's uh, reasonably realistic. The Raspberry Pi won't give you the realism of a data center in terms of the lowest layers, like the management interface or the power interface. Uh, but if you're floating at the application level or um, at the network level, at least, um, it's very, very adequate. And when we look at, uh, at the Pi 4, the computing power is become so significant that you actually want to use a 64-bit distribution. Uh, the Raspberry uh, Pi Foundation has announced 64-bit support for Raspbian. Um, I don't know if the um, images are considered supported or not, but uh, they're floating out, uh, out there. Ubuntu has also uh, added um, to their Ubuntu server images 64-bit uh, versions of the same. Um, so you have options. And when you set up your cluster, if it's Pi 4, I strongly recommend you do it with a 64-bit OS because it simplifies the data types uh, significantly. You don't have to go and, and use long, long int data types or the like. Just uh, ints will be 64 bits natively. And for things like what I was showing um, 
with um, and the Monte Carlo method. Um, you can exceed counts of 4 billion very quickly with a, with a Raspberry Pi 4, and that means you're exceeding a, a standard integer on 32 bits. So if you don't want to be adjusting the code that you can get from um, sources like uh, the Morrison book or the Oak Ridge uh, uh, Git, uh, Git repository, um, having a 64-bit environment is really a time saver. OK, I'm over time, so I don't think we can have questions. But uh, here's how to find me. Uh, you can find me on Twitter. You can send me email. I'm also Federico at Red Hat, if you prefer uh, the more corporate address. Um, and um, that's it. There will be new versions of the cluster coming uh, in the coming months. So since all the conferences these days are virtual, you can probably see uh, recordings of, of new versions of the cluster from, uh, from future events. Awesome. Thank you so much, Federico. Um, that was an amazing talk. And if you want to continue conversations, we don't have time for Q&A right now, but please feel free to go to the breakout room under Expo tab. Uh, Federico, if you can go and hang out there as well for a few minutes in case anyone has a few questions for you. I've uh, pinned the link to the track chat here. Thank you so much. Thank you.